as you know, I have a lot of favorite people. But one of them is Cassie. Cassie, you're one of my favorite people. Yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> but anyway, Cassie uh, posted a meme today. I think it was yesterday or today. Um, it, and it's, a meme is spelled M-E-M-E, -E, isn't it? So it's really, it's, it should be a meme. So um, Kathy posted a meme, and it kind of fits in with what I'm sharing this morning. I don't know much. I resonate with that. I don't know much, but four things I do. Remember this, Kathy? Four things I do. The Bible is real. Jesus is real. Heaven is real. God's love is real. And she said, with a firm yes. Yeah, and I resonate with that. Um, I was going to say, I don't know why I have come to such a strong conviction over the years of, of who God is and what he means to me um, and the fact that, that if he is real. i got to make sure I have what I need here. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about John chapter, um, first John chapter 1, the four, first four verses there today. Um, and basically, as Rob read in chapter 1 of the Gospel of John, the first John, John reiterates the reality of the truth that he knows. And remember, I bug you a lot with this. I say, this is just not John. This is just not an apostle writing information to a bunch of people. This is God's word. This is God's word. God inspired. God spoke to and through John and Paul and Peter and Matthew and Mark. All of them, he spoke through them and they penned these words. So I always think of this as I'm reading this. This is written to me. God is penning these words to me. So when he, um, when he shares words of encouragement, words of challenge, words of instruction, words of insight, this is to me. God is saying these words to me. So when I read scripture, hopefully a little bit, you'll understand from that perspective. Maybe that's becoming a little bit more uh, real to you. John talks ab about God being incarnate. Uh, he talks about the first chapter of the Gospel of John, of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and he, the Word, was God. Uh, some more verses there, but I can't remember them all. And this is what he says kind of in the very beginning of the first John. By the way, something I want to remind you about, I encourage you, I don't think I've, I've told you this, but I would really love it if you guys would read through the book of John, the first John, over the next several weeks. Do you know that you can read the book of First John, five chapters, in between 10 and 20 minutes? That's what it takes you. And if you read that a few times a week, you would get that pretty much deep into your heart and soul, particularly if you said, which is a good thing to do, God, I'm going to read your word this morning, and I would love it, God, if you would just speak deep into my heart and make this real to me, make it personal, and teach me through your word this morning. Well, you're amazed at what God will do. He's done it many times with me. He'll do it for you. He will do what you ask when it comes to his word in your life. That's where God wants to bless you the most. That's where the abundant life is. It's when we understand God and his word and how it applies to us. So um, God incarnate, that's what John is talking about. That is such a strange concept for us normal people. It's kind of like the Trinity. How well do you understand God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? How do you put that together and apply that in your life? The Trinity. The Trinity is not a biblical term. But the Trinity is a biblical concept. It's a theology in scriptures. It's a, yeah, that, that is it's basically true. It's like, how, how easy it for, is it for you to grab the Immaculate Conception? You all know what that is? That's where Mary was made to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit and gave birth to Jesus. That was the incarnation. When Jesus became, God became man and came to this earth. That's the incarnation. How hard is that to believe? I think it's kind of hard. How hard is it to believe that Jesus was in fact the person who said, who did what he said he was going to do? You know, he was put on the cross, he died for our sins, he ended up in the grave. He was there for three days, which he predicted that he would be, and then he rose again, and he did that. He was seen by over 500 people. But for us normal, regular type people, how hard is it to actually believe that that happened? Yeah, for some reason, it's not hard for any, me anymore. There's a song that Faye and I sung a lot 
over the last number of years. I don't know if I can remember all, all the words, but it kind of goes like this. But I believe that God looked down to earth and saw the sins of men. I believe his love compelled him to his soul is half for him. I believe the Holy Spirit caused a virgin to conceive. I believe she had a baby boy and Jesus was his name. I believe that Jesus lived a perfect life in every way. Though I believe that he was tempted on the mount for 40 days. I believe that he experienced the trials that we go through so that one day we can pray to him and we know what to do. I believe they led him to a cross where he was lifted high and I believe he put, took the sin upon himself and then he died. I believe he rose again and soon he's coming back for me. I believe it, I believe it, I believe. You want to hear it again? No. <laughs> so, <laughs> Dominic is really good about my voice here because they don't so, 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 what do you think causes me to believe that? So, you know, I grew up hearing if you if you believe it enough, and and focus on it enough, and believe it's going to happen, then it's true. But that's not true. And do you think that this these things that I share with you from the Word of God in song, if I say I believe it, I believe it, I believe it enough, then I'll believe it. The reason I believe it is something that happens in our life that doesn't happen in the meaning in any other religious quote-unquote type experience. When we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we surrender, more importantly, when we surrender ourselves to Him, what happens to us? What comes in? Okay. Or, you, you ask a question. Yes. Don't get carried away now. <laughs> you ask a question, why, why do I believe what I believe? Yeah, that'd be good. Is for by grace you are saved through faith. That scripture, you yeah. not of yourself, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are blessed by grace. We receive the Holy Spirit into our life. I have received the Holy Spirit in my life. The Holy Spirit wasn't terribly active in my younger life. It didn't become active in my life till I surrendered myself more and more to Him and said, "God, I surrender my life to You. I want to be filled." And controlled by the Holy Spirit. And like I've told you before, when we when we ask for spiritual gifts from God, so to speak, when we ask God to move us spiritually, when we ask God to heal us spiritually, when we ask Him to fill us, when we ask for the abundant life spiritually, God's really good about doing that. And I experienced that. When I surrendered and gave myself to Him and surrendered more as I got older and went through some hard knocks and ended up on my face on the ground, that's what God meant. So, hmm? yes, amen. So, God incarnate is the eternal Son of God without ceasing to be God. He took on a fully human nature, and that's what Christians have, been, have long called the incarnation. The act whereby the Son of God assumed the human nature, or the mystery by which Jesus Christ, the eternal Word, was made known in order to accomplish the work of our salvation. That's what incarnation is. Out of this first chapter of John, I've identified three points that I want to share with you. I usually am not this logical in my preaching, but I figured that had to be since um, Don was going to be here. I didn't know he was going to be around. Let me share with you First uh, John 1. It's the NIV. It's entitled, the top of my Bible, it's entitled, The Incarnation. After making purification for sins, it's a continuation of the verse. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty of God. And then finally, John 10, 30 says, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. Jesus is real. He's not a myth. Jesus is for us. That's the second one. Jesus is for us. Jesus is on our team. Jesus is our Savior. And Jesus' life is for our life. Jesus' life is given for our life. Here's some scripture that focuses on those. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against, against us? That's Romans 10, 49. God is, Jesus is on our team. He's for us. He's not against us. So when Paul writes that in Romans, you know, he's talking about everybody because Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, breathed that truth into Paul that he wrote, and that's for all of us, you know, 
He is for us. He is not against us. John, 1 John 4, 14 says, And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. He is our Savior. And finally, um, this is how you know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. That's 1 John 3, 16. There, I'm not going to connect this, but you know, the Gospel of John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave us his only son. Whoever believes in me will not perish, but have eternal life. It's really interesting that 1 John 3, 16 is somewhat similar. I don't think, well, you know, it's what to say. I don't think John decided to put this verse on 3.16 because he wanted to connect it to John 3.16 because in those days, back then, there were no verses. They all read it that was one. It was later on that they were divided into verses. But that verse, 1 John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. That's the big deal. How do we know love? What love is? Jesus laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Greater love has no man that he laid down his life for a friend. You know what? I was thinking about that. Yesterday, I think it was. Well, who of us is going to lay down our life for somebody? I mean, who of us, if we're in a situation where we see a situation that is going to require somebody to die, and we choose to be that person? I'd like to think that I'm noble enough to do that. Um, but I wonder if my weakness would allow me to do that. I don't know. But I guess what I was thinking about is um, I think that could be a, a true statement in terms of most, it is true, of course, but that's not necessarily what God is expecting us to understand. Understand that I am willing to sacrifice and deny myself for what I think is important to me, what I love doing or not doing, what I think are my rights or not my rights. I am willing to deny those and give it up for somebody that you know that needs to be ministered to, that needs to be it needs to be loved. And giving my life for that person. I think kind of that's part of what that means. So, Jesus' is life for our life. The last point is, Jesus is joy. Jesus gives joy, he brings joy, and he is our eternal joy. How does he do that? Well, again, I want to share some scripture, and I'm going to challenge you to maybe do some reading on your own. So um, in John 17, this is when John's with his disciples, and he's, um, he's praying to the Father right now, I believe, he's saying, I'm coming to you now, that's Jesus talking to God, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Now, you know, we probably do have time, so I'm going to, um, so I'm going to read you what it means when he says these things. Because it might be helpful to know what these things are. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things, Rados, while I'm still in the world. These things he says so that they may have the full measure of my joy, Jesus said. So after Jesus said these, this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you have granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those who have you have given to him. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought your glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those who you have, I have revealed you to those who you gave me out of the world. <coughs> they were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words that you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father, protect me by the power of your name, the name you gave me, 
so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one you gave me destruction, so the scriptures could be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. He's basically, it's, I'm giving them eternal life. I'm, I mean, there's several things that we can pull out of here in terms of what those things are, but he's, he's giving them eternal life. God has given them, can be done, and he is giving them eternal life. Eternal life is the joy. Um, Charles Stanley, you know, has passed away recently. Faye and I were blessed by his ministry. Um, and um, I've, I've read, and I think some of you do too here, I've read devotionals for years, every day from uh, his ministry. Charles Stanley applied something this way, in this way. He said, everything in the Bible has been given to us to help us and enable us to enjoy an intimate relationship with God. Did you get that? Everything in the Bible has been given to us to help us and enable us to enjoy an intimate relationship with God. God's top priority for your life is to walk in close fellowship with Him. God's top priority for your life is to walk fellowship with him. Another scripture in John 15, 11. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Now this follows this follows um, an encouragement from the, an encouragement from Jesus and an illustration from Jesus about the branches and the vine and being connected to the vine. If we as branches are not connected to the vine, we wither and fall away. So we need to be connected to where the um, substance is, you know, the food is. His food is, you know, through the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. He wants us to be connected to that. And if we connect, or we are connected to that, that his joy will be in us, and your joy may be complete. Understand? That's how we experience joy. Something else from Charles Stanley that I wanted to share that's, that's within applications. Believers sometimes excuse very foolish behavior with the statement, God wants me to be happy. The truth is, God wants something much better for us than happiness. He wants joy for us. But that comes only in obedience to him. I shared with you a story a number of months ago, probably a few years ago, of my sitting down with a brother-in-law who uh, is now an ex-brother-in-law. I sat down to, to try to counsel and encourage him. We got a puppy. Uh, <laughs> oh, what are you my doing? goodness. Pardon me. Molly. Molly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Molly, you are in trouble. Pasha never did that. Anyway, I sat down with this ex-brother-in-law, and he, he tried to explain why he was choosing to do what he did. He gave some details about his relationship, and they were tough, I don't know. But he said, I just want to be happy. He said, I think God wants me to happy, be happy. And I looked, at, I looked at him, and I said, God didn't call us to be happy. God calls us as husbands to sacrifice, as a matter of fact. Or if you want, to sacrifice for each other. And so you may be in a situation, you may be in a marriage or a relationship of some type that's hard, that's really hard. And God calls you to stick it out and to sacrifice and to be obedient to him. And, and how much does that mean? How much do you have to put up with? How much do you have to take? How much do you have to give? Uh, how much did Jesus give? You really have to do everything. You have to give everything. I came to a point in my life, phase of my relationship has not been easy. It's been a blessing, but it's not been easy. And, I, and I've pushed and wrestled against that for years. Um, I don't know how long ago it's been, 20 or 30 years, I don't know, but I finally came to the point where this is going to sound bad, guys, and it's not like, it's not, it's not this bad. But I came to the point and said, God, this is my lot in life. This is my lot, so I've got to put up with it and deal with it. And that changed. As I grew into that, I said, God, this is my privilege, joyful life. This is what you've called me to. 
No, and I want to live well into the law. And I want to sacrifice as Christ sacrificed for, this, for the church. Now, Faye's had to do the same thing with me. You know, you've been around me long enough to know I'm not the most perfect people around. You know, so there's some there's some mental issues that Faye has to deal with me. But it's, we both do that in the relationship. We both deal with that kind of stuff. We both put up with stuff. So, um, so that's how we get joy. Charles Stanley also says, um, "Obey God." Consequences to him. That means total obedience. Even if it doesn't seem to be convenient, you really sense that this is what God would want you to do. Even though it's not easy, it's really, really hard, it seems to be a negative in your life, you do it anyway because that's what God says. That's where the joy comes from, is our obedience to him. And we're all trying to live into that. Now, the song that I, I may sing to, to you and I may sing another one. I'm going to close, this, close our time here with this song. And Donna, you don't sing this much, just so you know. So it goes like this. And you need a little song.